So we started off with a bit of a Debian slant and to this distro summit, and I guess one of the uh, messages you can also take from this is that your distro probably does similar stuff. Um, QA is possibly more advanced, possibly less advanced than your distro. There's stuff that you can learn from Debian. There's stuff that Debian can learn from you. So when Lucas says join the QA team, of course he means that you should all become Debian developers. But what he actually means is that, <laughs> is that um, even if you are coming from another distro to um, the QA team, then there's cooperation that can, be ha can happen and possibly things to be learned from each other. So uh, keep that in mind. And B. Dale. Garby, who probably doesn't need any further introduction because he's everywhere, and he also wears the same shirt everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's not the same shirt, but they all, they all look like that. They're beautiful. So th this is B. Dale. Um, he's the uh, Linux open source head chief something at HP, I think. I don't know the official title of that, but I think it was on your slide, so once that is up, you can actually correct me. And uh, now returning a little bit from Debian back to a more distro focus, BDL is going to give us an update on the Linux standard space. And I think you have history and all of that in your talk probably, so without further ado, please welcome BDL. Yep, thanks. <laughs> so can all of you hear me okay? This is working? Good? Excellent. Um, and by the way, um, what a great crowd for a distro summit. I'm curious, uh, how many of you are using Debian or Debian derivative distributions? <laughs> okay. So how many of you are not using Debian? Or... Okay, you're welcome to. That's cool. Um, I'm, just, I'm always curious because it depends on where you go in the world and what kind of event it is. There are certainly places where you would see that ratio very differently. Um, there's certainly, uh, within the kernel development community, for example, there's probably a, a higher proportion of people running Fedora right now than there are in this room. Um, but, you know, it doesn't really matter a whole lot. Um, <clears throat> for those of you who don't know me, um, I, you know, I've been doing free software stuff since before we knew that's what we were supposed to call it. Um, and I do serve as open source and Linux chief technologist for HP. That's the official title. Um, more relevant, I've been doing Debian things for a very long time. <clears throat> um, and probably the most interesting thing in the last year or so is I was invited to um, start participating with the Ubuntu technical board. Whether I'm officially a member or not is a subject of current debate, and I don't actually care what the answer is. Um, but the point is to sort of represent Debian's technical interests in that context. I'm pretty confident that makes me the only person showing up for Ubuntu technical board meetings who doesn't run Ubuntu on anything. Um, but for the talk today, I'm actually, it's, it's the connection I have with the Linux Foundation and some activity that happens there that has sort of a long history, which I've been peripherally involved with going all the way back to certainly as far as 99 or 2000, but um, uh, I was able to find documentation to 2001 um, related to the Linux standard space and that activity that I want to talk about today. This is in some ways probably a better thing to talk about in a distro mini summit than a lot of other things I could because it's a, a really quintessential example of an activity that crosses distribution boundaries and in fact is intended to help sort of smear out the differences between our various um, favorite distributions. Of course, you know, <clears throat> that's what I really rather talk about is rockets, but you can come right by Wednesday morning and hear about that if you'd like. Okay, so a little context. This is actually something I went and found and pulled out of an HP internal presentation on the LSB from 2001. Um, where it said the goal of the Linux standards base is to develop and promote a set of standards that will increase compatibility among Linux distributions and enable software applications to run on any compliant Linux system. And that's always been sort of the fundamental objective of the LSB. It's not about trying to force distros to do things differently or something like this. It's really about, wouldn't it be nice if application developers could write their applications once and in some Nirvana-esque view of the world, maybe even package them and distribute them once and have them just run on anything that, you know, claimed to be Linux and could demonstrate some compliance. And then <clears throat> I think, you know, at that time there was this notion that if we got this right, it might actually help to recruit software vendors. And in this context, you know, thinking about this being an HP internal presentation, this is 
When we say software vendors here, we really mean those things we call ISVs, the people who build big applications that get delivered in binary-only form for lots and lots of money, you know, oracles and SAPs and things like this. Um, and the notion was, at that time, <coughs> that there were lots of those applications that had not been ported into the Linux environment, and that if we got this LSB thing right, it might help to provide a larger target of opportunity for those ISVs to help motivate them to want to port their applications to Linux. Of course, time's rolled forward. Things are a little different today, and that's why I sort of wanted to talk about this, is to give you a sense not only of sort of where the LSV came from and what its original motivations were, which I'll talk a little bit more about, but then kind of where are things today and what are the continuing uh, topic areas, you know, where, where there's uh, investments of time and energy going in, and where might it continue to be interesting and relevant to all of you. And the only caveat I have to throw into this is that um, I'm talking about this from the perspective of someone who, in both the HP corporate environment and more recently in the Linux Foundation Board of Directors environment, has been very involved in caring about the LSV, trying to make sure it got the funding it needed and had the attention it deserved and all of that. I cannot uh, claim to have ever done a single line of code or useful work on behalf of the LSB. So <clears throat> if you have detailed questions about it, I've got links for you to show you where to go on the Foundation's website to find detailed information later if you'd like it. So, you know, look, what's the whole point of the standardization thing? Well, <clears throat> uh, thanks to Ted Show, I borrowed a couple of these slides from him. Um, the thing that we have to care about is that you know, one of the great beauties of Linux is that it is, in effect, so malleable, that we can all change it and morph it to do the things we want. We can evolve it. We can make it better. I think Linus and many of the core kernel developers have been famous over time for saying that, look, you know, we want to maintain a stable ABI for application developers <coughs> so that their programs can continue to work across kernel version boundaries, but inside the kernel source tree, all bets are off. You know, if your device drivers are out of tree, don't expect them to continue having all the same interfaces and work right across multiple kernel variances. And if you go out from the kernel community, it's certainly been the case that it's been much easier for us to think about and work on source level compatibility in the Linux and open source world than it has been binary compatibility over years. In fact, even in the Debian Ubuntu space, the commitment that the Ubuntu development community has made pretty much from the beginning was to be source compatible with Debian. Um, and in fact, all of the .debs they ship are in fact recompiled from source. They're not, you know, binaries taken out of the Debian mirror network. So um, this whole question of, you know, exactly what's the point, what's the meaning, you know, what, when you start talking about binary application to OS compatibility, who is it you're really trying to serve? And one of the challenges I think the LSV faced early on was this notion that it only actually mattered for those applications that free software people didn't want to care about, which were the big, bad, expensive binary applications. And one of the things that I've observed is that, in fact, that's not really true, that there's a lot of value to us as software developers, whether we're free software developers or not, in understanding how to create programs that are portable and to successfully deliver applications that don't require lots of massaging to work across different distributions, even if there are valid reasons for those distros to, to differentiate themselves. On the other hand, you also have to step back and take a look at this from sort of a bigger worldview. I've got a quote from the Gartner folks later in here that bugs me, but I put it anyway. Um, <coughs> the, the thing that we have to understand is that, you know, people outside of our ecosystem look at us and go, oh, gee, you know, all this variation just makes things more complicated and, and difficult, doesn't it? So over time, what's happened within the LSB community is this, this understanding that there has to be an ability to articulate some value of the LSB, not just for you know, distros and, and application developers, but for system vendors and end users as well. And I won't bore you with the details of this. You can read through it if you'd like. But the notion really is sort of captured here, this notion that you ought to be able to choose your application somewhat independently of the distribution that you want to run them on. And the way we can most easily help that happen is to make sure that the distributions don't diverge in unmeaningful ways. Um, and that, in effect, there is sort of a single definition of what it means to be Linux. So <clears throat> today, you know, there's, there's this long history. Uh, uh, for a long time, the LSB was sort of owned and operated by the Free Standards Group. That's one of the organizations that came together to form the current Linux Foundation. So today, the LSB operates as a working group, the Linux Foundation. 
As a consequence, the CTO of the Linux Foundation is nominally sort of responsible for uh, the care and feeding of that from an organizational standpoint. Um, until recently, that was Ted Cho, but with Ted's change of jobs and so forth, and the fact that his term of loan from IBM to the foundation was coming to a conclusion anyway, um, the Linux Foundation CTO position is currently open, and Jim Zemlin is interested in trying to hire somebody. So if you would get all excited about that, feel free to ask me questions later in the week. And well, you know, <clears throat> enough for the job description thing. Um, this has been identified as a key activity by those of us who are members of the Linux Foundation Board of Directors. And the reason is that we're very interested in trying to make sure that Linux as a brand stays meaningful going forward and that there is, in effect, sort of a single definition of what it means to be a Linux system. And it's come over time to be sort of integral to some other activities. I'll talk about that in just a minute. So what really are the objectives today? I think the real key is this idea that the LSB, in some sense, defines what it means to be Linux. That if you have a platform, an operating system distribution, that can be demonstrated to be compliant with the LSB, then it's Linux. It's a good Linux system. And it also provides sort of a common interface to which application developers can code and expect to have things work uniformly across platforms. It does this by minimizing these unhelpful variations between distributions. And to be a little more specific about that, the biggest um, area of focus so far has been on shared libraries and on you know, both the versioning and the definition of the interfaces to those libraries. There have been some really embarrassing moments um, in the last few years where different distributions change the you know, so names of different libraries at different times. And, you know, what it meant to be version three of a particular library got confusing. And that's the kind of stuff that drives application developers crazy and drives end users even more crazy because they don't necessarily have the technical wherewithal to unravel it and figure out what the problem really is. Now, if you never try to run any code that wasn't compiled and delivered to you by your distributor of choice, you might never ever see those problems. But the reality is, no matter how great the distribution is that we choose to run, there always seem to be these times where we end up taking some little piece of something that we want to run sometime, whether it's that simulation program for a particular aspect of rocket operation that you just can't get some other way. <coughs> um, or um, you know, maybe it's a media player plug-in for a browser or something like this. And all of these things can end up causing problems if we're not careful. And as I said, you know, the LSB has as one of its areas of focus these days, the LSB activity at the foundation, uh, trying to help aid in the development and creation of portable programs. And there's been a lot of documentation products and training materials and so forth created around the LSB that directly addresses that. And, you know, it, it still would be nirvana to have this notion that an ISV, particularly a big binary ISV, might get into the mode where they deliver a single version of a binary package and can expect it to be able to run on you know, a wide variety of distributions. Uh, one of the big challenges that I think the LSB has faced is that there's sort of a de facto standard around that already, and it's not necessarily the one that everyone would like to code to. So what is the situation today? Well, progress continues to be made, but those end goals do sort of remain elusive. Um, ISV pickup continues to lag. There have been some ISVs who have made strong assertions about their applications being coded to the LSB spec. There is this problem, though, we, it's sort of a wedge problem, <clears throat> where it, as you look at sort of the, the evolution of the functionality that application developers care about as being this line that's going up and to the right, and at any given moment in time, the LSB standardizes some set of libraries and interfaces, there's always this sort of wedge of space between what the application developer would like to be using at that moment and what's actually been standardized, because the LSB is a trailing spec, right? There's nothing in the LSB process that causes it to be terribly predictive. There's, there's no consensus within our community on how we should come together to standardize things before we've actually coded them and delivered them and people have started using them. So the good news is, over time, the surface area that's covered by the LSB has continued to expand, and it now covers an awful lot of stuff that's important to a lot of applications. But for any given sort of high-performance software vendor creating something like a big performance intensive database, um, at any given moment, would they ever be willing to commit to the notion that the LSB covers everything they care about? We haven't seen a whole lot of that yet. And I guess what I'm trying to convey is that we shouldn't be terribly surprised by that. But on the other hand, it doesn't mean that 
the LSB has been some kind of failure either. The things it's done have been really useful and really valuable. The other thing is, you know, I've tried to put this in sort of a politically pleasing way. Um, just for market share mix challenges the perception of need. Um, there are people who believe that for these sorts of commercial um, ISV applications that there already is a de facto standard and they don't need to care about these sorts of things. But, you know, this is this quote from the guys at Gartner. They say that, you know, the, the elusive portability and single vendor dominance are negative to Linux adoption. And this is, you know, analysts looking from the outside in. They're not us. They don't think the way we do about free software development, right? They're looking at this from a, how do you compare this to commercial Unix? How do you compare this to Windows? How do you compare it to, you know, platforms like that? And they're saying, yeah, it may not, you know, the, the, the magnitude of the negativity is something we could debate. But yeah, you have to accept that the fact that Linux isn't a single target, as if Windows were ever a single target, um, <coughs> that somehow this is negative to Linux adoption. So we have to care about this. It's important from an industry risk management standpoint and for driving greater Linux adoption for the LSB to stay sort of funded and, and active. So what's going on? Well, what the foundation has been doing recently is trying to focus on, you know, the LSB for these sorts of enterprise applications because that's where the um, funding members of the foundation have their greatest interest. But at the same time, creating this concept of a profile sort of in parallel with the core activity. And the first profile that is of great significance is the one that's been created for Moblin. Uh, how many of you know about Moblin? This is sort of a mobile netbook-oriented-ish distribution thing that um, has had lots of attention from Intel in particular, but it's now operating as a Linux <coughs> Foundation working group. And one of the things that's happened for Moblin is that a profile has been created for you know, a few additional things to specify on top of the core LSB and the litmus test for whether an application is Moblin compatible and therefore can go into the Moblin app store and things like that is do you comply with the checking standards for that version of the LSB and the associated Moblin profile. So for the first time in the Moblin context, we're actually seeing a sort of useful consequence of the existence of all the test suite stuff around the LSB where it's actually going to be used as the acceptance test for whether an application is considered mobile and compliant or not. So in, in parallel with that, though, there's this notion that, you know, enterprise distributions keep going to sort of, you know, they're stretching their release cycles out because they're starting to understand that enterprise customers deploying big apps don't want to have things rolling all the time. So one of the efforts here is to sort of have the LSB release cycles kind of line up with when the major enterprise commercial Linux distributions are willing to incorporate uh, new shared library functionality into their releases. And so there's this notion that, you know, 4.1 ends up being a maintenance release, adding a sort of optional Java support module. And then 5.0 would happen if and when the enterprise distributions are ready to adopt some of the library releases that are currently part of the Moblin ecosystem and part of that profile. So in this way, the work that's being done now in support of the Moblin activity ends up having the potential to benefit the sort of core enterprise users of the LSP over time um, as the enterprise distributions kind of catch up and are willing to run what are today slightly more bleeding edge library versions. And so there's this commitment on the part of the foundation's board to continue investing in tools, tests, processes, and so forth that would end up, you know, benefiting everybody in this space. Um, just a couple of words. This is another slide I grabbed from Ted about the Java support stuff. This, the notion is that um, <coughs> particularly when you start comparing Linux to other platforms that might be used for enterprise application deployment, um, the fact that there are people whose applications want to take advantage of some combination of C and Java technology or you know, have more Java content than C in some cases that maybe need some Java content for um, GUI installers and things like this, it became very important for there to be some kind of, you know, Java-ness associated with the LSB. And the current, my understanding of the current situation is it's in effect an optional module where you can claim to be sort of LSB plus J, is I guess what it's called, um, compliant. And if so, then people writing these sorts of applications can assume that there's a suitable amount of Java virtual machine and related runtime goo around. I'm not an expert on Java, may or may not ever want to be. So. <clears throat> Uh, from a resource standpoint, you know, as I talked about, there's this notion now that an important part of the LSB activity is to help developers understand 
what it means, um, how to write more portable applications, how to take advantage of the LSB tools and facilities at the foundation to deliver more portable applications. And so this has become a significant component of this thing that's now called the Linux Developer Network, which is you know, part of the ever-evolving web content at the Linux Foundation. If you haven't been out to look at that before, uh, ldn.linuxfoundation.org is an interesting place to go look. Uh, everything from jobs that are available to people who might have uh, skills and want to work in this space to the LSB directory in particular gives you a jumping off point to learn about a lot of this stuff. And the em emphasis really is on helping developers understand what to do and how to go about writing portable apps. And some of the recent improvements and changes to the tools in the sort of LSB 4.0 timeframe have made it much easier for developers to understand whether their apps are compliant with the current LSB standard or not. Um, and to, to test those sorts of things. So I'm about out of time, but I'll finish up by giving you pointers to both the um, page where the LSB working group hangs out and coordinates and collaborates their activities, and then again this um, LSB um, subsection within the Linux developer net. With that, I'll be happy to take any questions. I hope I've caused you to realize that you know, this stuff is still sort of interesting and relevant, even though it's sort of one of those, LSB is kind of one of those tokens that's been around a long time, and it's very easy to sort of just treat it as part of the landscape you don't have to think about. Um, and you know, if you, I'll be around the rest of the week, obviously, if you have questions or thoughts about this, or if you know somebody or you yourself you know, might be interested in that Linux Foundation CTO job, come poke me, and I'll be happy to put a good or bad word in someone's ear, depending on how the conversation goes. <coughs> right, any questions? Yeah. Right. Right. I don't have any, is, is there any work in place to, or and is this on the roadmap at all, for developers working on components of the OS that are potentially part of the LSB? How do we get developers to believe in interface compatibility and, and, and extensibility as just a common more? Because right now, you know, we break interfaces all the time because it's fun. How, is there, is there any, are there any tools and process for that to make these, that kind of thing easier? Or right. So to, so to summarize, you know, um, talked about sort of the user view of this and the, the, you know, the application developer's view, what's, the, you know, what, what's in it for people developing libraries and, and other system components that might be incorporated within the LSB spec boundaries. Um, really good question. I don't actually know a great answer for that. Um, but I will tell you that as somebody maintaining a bunch of packages in Debian, it drives me nuts that several of my prominent upstreams um, absolutely refuse to do shared library versioning because they just assume everybody ought to want to build everything from source every time. So it's a great question. Um, I don't know the answer. Ted Cho is here this week, and I thought maybe he might wander into the room, but I guess not. Um, good question to ask him, even though I know he's trying really hard to wrap his brain around new assignments and, you know, get away from this a little bit, but um, he'd be a good person to ask. I'll certainly take that back as a, as a query for the crowd. Yeah. How much time do we have for questions? A couple more? Keep going. Okay. Right. Right, okay, so, so, so the issue is that as distributions start, like Debian, start to incorporate more of the LSB sort of requirement stuff in packaged form, that the dependencies start up ending up mushrooming some. Um, I don't actually know a great answer to that. It would be an excellent topic for further discussion here. 
And in particular, I think you have to get to specifics pretty quickly on this, because my suspicion is that some of this isn't actually mandated, desired, or you know, required or even desired by the LSB spec per se. It's just that the people implementing it have, you know, implementing the package dependency stuff have been lazy and said, oh, well, I know that if we had this here, that requirement would be met, and let's just include it. And, you know, I personally have been guilty over the years of, of taking core packages and saying, well, yes, of course, you know, it, it's not that expensive. Let's carry this extra library dependency around all the time. And, and then the people who want it have it and the ones who don't, don't. Yeah, and then the, the, the Debian installer guys come around with their baseball bats and beat me over the head for requiring, you know, an extra half a terabyte of space on the installer media or something. But... <laughs> um, it's, it, I mean, it's, I'm joking a little bit, but, you know, this is the, it's a classic problem. Part of what I personally, you know, to, to get on my Debian hat for just a second, part of what I've always found thrilling about the distro is the notion I can install an absolutely bare minimum system and then just incrementally add the bits I want, and therefore I know why all those bits are there and what they're doing. And this is, you know, this does sort of violate that expectation a little bit. Um, I personally don't believe that this is necessary in order to achieve you know, compliance with LSB stuff. But I, again, I'm not an expert on the details. We'll have to talk about that soon. Can I just quickly interrupt yeah. for a second? Um, we were supposed to have a 15 minute break now to allow people to switch rooms if you are interested in other mini -confs. This means that I don't want to kill off the conversation. We do have these 15 minutes if we want to, to discuss further about the LSB and I think it's good. Um, just those people who are looking to go to the, another session in another uh, mini-con should probably think about heading out. Sure. Those who are staying and uh, who want to discuss a little more about this, um, please go ahead and hit us with more questions. Hit be there with more questions. And I think also that um, keep in mind that we just had this idea floated that um, maybe this, this discussion, we need to further discuss this. There might still be buff room space available. And if any one of you is actually to, interested to the point of uh, wanting to organize a buff, get together for an hour or two and, and you know, start talking and get things rolling. So I'm, I'm sorry that I, you know, interrupted, but we're supposed to keep the schedule. Are there any more questions? Let's keep it going. Yeah. So the question is, has there been any thought given to expanding the LSB beyond Linux to include, you know, the BSDs or, or Open Solaris or something like that? There are certainly components of the LSB, um, things like the file system hierarchy standard and so forth, that have explicitly tried to cross those operating system boundaries. The LSB, however, you know, the combination of having Linux in its name and being hosted at the Linux Foundation and all of this sort of stuff, um, I, no, I don't think anybody seriously contemplated that. There's really no reason that you couldn't. And in fact, I personally think, you know, I, I, I gave a talk as long ago as LCA in Brisbane where I talked about the fact that everything we did in the name of portability supporting, you know, more processor architectures and Debian and all of this ended up benefiting everybody by driving the overall quality of the code up and the consistency and the amount of sort of non-laziness that was forced on programmers. Um, and I think the same thing's true here. I think other operating systems benefit from the fact that upstream, you know, library developers and so forth at least feel some, I hope they feel some embarrassment when they get these things horribly wrong, but sadly I have lots of instance proofs of the fact that they don't. <laughs> you asked a question. It was a good question, so... Yeah. So, so actually the interesting thing is um, the, the, the Solera stuff is a little interesting in the sense that there is an ongoing activity by another associated project at Software in the Public Interest to drive Open Solaris into a state where it is certifiable as an open source Unix under, you know, the Unix specification at the Open Group. So, Sorry, I was just trying to get to Dude, yeah, that's, that's so cool. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So there's this thing called the Open Office Presenter Console. Anyway. Um, one of the other things that's sort of bothered me about the LSB from a, a developer standpoint is the fact that there are people who are willing to build the Is there a process for dropping bad 
Right, so the question is, is sort of how does the spec get maintained in terms of, of things possibly being taken out of the spec that are proven to not be the right answer or something? The answer is, yeah, there's such mechanisms. I don't know that anybody actively exercises them. One of the things that's sort of interesting, if you look over the history, is there was a point in time where the LSV development activity was, oh, what's the right way to put this? It was more community-oriented than it has been in recent times in the sense that there was more volunteer involvement and people who were sort of genuinely motivated because they wanted to get this right. And I'm not trying to say that people aren't trying to get it right today, but the emphasis has certainly shifted somewhat with, you know, major sort of upheaval that happened a while back and the involvement of resources at places like the Russian Academy of Sciences to go write tests. And, and it's been kind of cool, actually, to see some of those regression test suite things being offered and sort of nudged back into upstream packages, because a lot of times that's where a lot of that stuff can do the most good. But the consequence is that the, I think the focus has somehow gotten a little more mechanistic, maybe. It, it's all about, you know, how do, we, how do we actually sort of hit the next milestone? And one of the things I don't personally know, because I'm just not that close to the day, -day, day activities, is how easy it is to just sort of show up and, and express an idea or get it into the queue. Um, I'm certainly personally always willing to take an email about, you know, with a question about something like this and go poke the right people. Um, I, you know, it's, it's one of the sort of consequences of position, I guess, but being on the foundation's board does occasionally, you know, allow me to get my emails attended to. Though getting getting people to actually answer queries like, could I have some slides about the LSD B to use it? LCA don't always get answered quickly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just you know, it's the way the world works. But um, no, seriously, um, I'm always happy to help make those connections and figure out you know, who we can go poke to get things looked at. Um, it's part of what I do. So, okay, well, yeah. Do any of the distros do automated LSB testing as part of their internal processes? Um, Ubuntu does some now? That's cool. Um, yeah, Ubuntu historically, I mean, canonical slash mark, have had kind of a love-hate relationship with the LSB, and, and um, it, you know, it really has to do with sort of how you feel about the whole sort of binary application compatibility thing. But um, at HP, we actually... Um, contributed some resources to help get Debian compliant the first time, and two or three times since then have actually paid people to do LSB compatibility testing on different Debian stable releases. But uh, I, don't, I don't know how much of that's really stuck. I know that at some point it got added to the release objectives. Might have been for Sarge. I don't remember. It got added to the release objectives that each release be compliant with whatever the then current LSB spec was. Um, I don't know how seriously that gets tested, though. I just haven't been paying much attention recently. I, I don't know anything about what other distributions might do, except that um, for LSB 4.0, uh, all the sort of relevant distributions did, you know, uh, declare compliance, and I'm not aware of there being many exceptions either exceptions written into the compliance assertions or exceptions of distros not caring. So, I, I, you know, I, to, to be quite blunt about it, I think the, the, the toughest time caring has to be our buddies at Red Hat because having a de facto market leadership position, um, I, I think that the right people there understand the value of this kind of convergence across distributions, and there's never been any sense of negativity or pushback or whatever. But... Um, you know, the, the, there are certainly some technical decisions that have been made over time, at least uh, with some conscious understanding of what can we do to make sure that it doesn't become so hard for them to cope with it that they decide to not care because that would be bad. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Um, it's on the take list for Rob releases, but that's, you know, usually something that right. happens in the lab. Right. And I believe we don't, in, at least in Fedora, we don't install the LSD packages by default, but they are things you can depend on. So you can say install Red Hat LSD, and then you can get if there's a LSD package that's exposed. We don't necessarily, uh, we don't necessarily lay that down to begin with. 
So I'm pretty sure one of the LSB base packages is now part of the standard Debian install, but I'm not certain. It's not? Oh, oh right, okay. I know. And that was, that was not something that Fedora wanted because we had a bunch of other who, who, who would? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah, um, right. So in a packaging sense, it's, it's a little awkward, but we have a meta package that is going to be compliant. Um, but it's not something that's, that's been an approach lots of folks have taken. I think it works just fine. So, Okay, well, I, I appreciate the interactivity and the, the interest in this. Um, you know, uh, as someone who at least for a little while longer is on the Linux Foundation board, if you happen to be an individual member of the foundation, I am running for re-election board. <laughs> <laughs> Enough said. Um, this is something I've cared about for a long time. I, I was a, a, a proponent of the sort of Nirvana view early on, and then when we sort of reality set in and we realized, you know, the, the realities of a trailing spec and how hard it would be to get big ISVs to play, I will admit that, you know, I've been relatively unsuccessful at even getting, you know, my favorite ISV, the one I work for, to, um, <clears throat> you know, play ball all the time. But um, at the same time, I think we all have come to understand just how much value there's been in helping to keep the various distributions from diverging in, as I like to put it, unhelpful ways. And um, I certainly would, would hope that all of you continue to, you know, pay at least some attention to what's happening with the LSB. And, Take advantage of those resources. If you're an application developer, go out and take a look if you haven't at the LDN stuff. Um, I'm kind of amazed um, since they brought Brian Prophet on board and various other folks got serious about working on things, the, the depth and utility of some of the Linux Foundation web content took this big step function up. I, it's still not you know a place that I hang out a whole lot, but there's a lot of useful resources there. Go take advantage of them. Okay, thanks very much.